Nahida's rule as Archon up until recently is interesting. While it can categorically be classified as a failure due to her inability to actually serve as the Archon of her people, I think there is an incredibly valuable lesson to take away from how the God of Wisdom was treated for 500 years, and it's the same lesson that Conria learned the hard way. What happened in Sumeru and to Nahida by the Mages is the exact reason our fantastic and extremely sexually attractive overlords in the Great Celestia above consistently blasts nations. Mankind's hubris and vanity often leads them down a deplorable path of self-destruction and societal decay, and as such, we must turn to the benevolent heavenly principles and keep to Celestia's great word that the arrogance of mankind must end. And for those thinking I'm being too harsh and labeling Nahida's stint as Archon as a failure, I assure you, I am but a humble being using the words of the oldest god as a metric here, as it was Rex Lapis himself that, quote, still remembers that moment when the final Archon took their divine seat, thus ending the Archon of War and the era of warring gods. The seven were a diverse lot dispersed far and wide, but they all shouldered the burden of guiding humanity. However, he would go on to state, quote, the world has changed much since then, and all that was once familiar has faded into memory. The seven seats changed and again were changed till five of the seven at the table were all departed, nor would the duty of guiding humanity be honored by the new Archons. The last sentence is especially interesting, because he's straight up saying all the new Archons, Nahida included, don't guide humanity, so either he didn't know of Nahida's predicament, or he just didn't care. Of these two options, which one is the more likely? And actually, no, scratch that, he 100% knew that Nahida was imprisoned by humans, because after the Sumeru Archon quest, his story now reads as such, quote, as time passed, many of the Seven's titles changed hands, and only two of the first seven and remain in positions of rulership, Rex Lapis and the NMO Archon. So if he doesn't care that Nahida was captured and he still goes on to state she doesn't guide humanity, <laughs> why should I? <laughs> what, are you gonna hold me to the standards of a god? <laughs> Uh, to a slightly different point, however, I'm curious why he never assisted Nahida or any of the other seven for that matter, Zhongli especially given he was ready to assist Venti when he first came to Liyue. Literally, it's said that the first time Barbados came to Liyue, Morax had assumed the god of freedom had encountered a crisis that he needed his help with and was prepared to lend him his help in any way possible. I mean, in actuality, Venti was there to drink with him, but the point still stands. Is there a greater crisis than being unable to rule because you were captured by humans after, I mean, expending your powers during the Cataclysm. It's not even like you would have had to haul ass to get there. Sumeru was right next to Liyue, like he just, he just didn't care, bro. Or he wanted an invitation to help, in which case, well, that's something. <laughs> Anyway, on to Nahida. I'm just going to give a brief overview of what exactly happened to her in both timelines. In the original Tavats, Nahida was born shortly after the death of Greater Lord Rukadavata, but was spawn camped by the sages, captured, and imprisoned in the sanctuary of Sudastana for about 500 years. Sumeru would then go on to be ruled by the sages, who rarely spoke of Lesser Lord Kusanali, only ever showing reverence to the now deceased Greater Lord Rukadavata. Eventually, a man named Azar would climb the ranks of Sumeru Academia to become the Grand Sage. Under him, Sumeria, which was already the land of knowledge, became absolute in this ideal, allowing a little other, most notably the arts, to shine. Art. Dance. Aren't you ashamed of pursuing such frivolous and meaningless activities in this land of knowledge and reason? Our Archon created the utopia that is Sumeru City for all scholars who sought validity, verity, and truth, while people like you wish to defile it. No! I believe that our Archon never rejected the arts. Even the Goddess of Flowers dedicated a dance to her. With your lack of intellectual credentials, I do not believe you are qualified to debate with me. What you should be doing is finding workers to tear down this ridiculous eyesore. Man, I hate this nigga, bro. <laughs> hate this guy. <laughs> anyway, later on, he enacted a plan to create a god with the Fatui Harbingers, the Doctor, and the Balladeer, after having deemed Kusanali a disappointment. Some sages were against this plan, so Azar did the only reasonable thing and locked them up. In preparation of the new god, he oversaw an energy harvesting plan in which the Academia had the city of Sumeru live through countless of Zeru festivals. They would then capture the dreams of the people to power up the new god. Man, this nigga's a villain, bro. He is a villain through and through. He's capturing dreams for evil purposes. <laughs> This guy's a monster. Eventually, the sages successfully created a god to which Nahida, I mean, gasses, let's be completely honest. A body that capitalizes on the balladeer's original construction as a mechanical puppet, with the gnosis serving as a constant power supply. How much effort and resources did the sages put into this? 
From a purely technological perspective, it's a commendable achievement indeed. It's no exaggeration to say, this is the culmination of human wisdom. But in the end, the Shoki no Kami lost to the Traveler and Nahida. Kusanali then took control of the Academia, shut down the Akasha Terminal, and exiled the Sages. In the new timeline, the only difference is Nahida's origin story, where she's always been the Denjo Archon, it's just that now the Sages found Nahida after the Cataclysm, but because she had expended a lot of energy during it, she lost her memories, and was very weak, so they sort of just snatched her. This entire story is a perfect example of why Celestia must be as harsh as they are with punishing hubris, and why humans cannot be left to their own devices, because otherwise we end up with an authoritarian dictatorship solely focused on one goal, never minding the costs. This right here is the problem with the hubris of creation and a potential reason the sustainer laments mankind's arrogance. When vanity takes control of humans, it's humans that suffer, and Celestia's job, no matter how convoluted it may seem, at its core is to look out for humanity. God, I love them. The sages took control of Sumeru, and in their attempt to transgress their limits, in a similar way to Conria, made everyone else suffer for it. And don't get it twisted, I'm all for human progress, and so is Celestia! But while ambition and progress are essential for human development, it is crucial to approach the pursuit of transcendence with humility and a nuanced understanding of the potential drawbacks. In Azar's case specifically, his hubris made him blind to the ethical considerations, and as a result, he authorized highly unethical programs that caused people like Dunyar's art to suffer. I often hear that Celestia simply likes being in control, and that's why they nuke nations who try to look past them. No. No, 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 no. Conria existed for thousands of years, despite never once having a god. But it was only after Conria fucked up by tampering with the Abyss and Forbidden Knowledge that Celestia paid them any mind and just said, yo, these niggas got to go, bro. Riddled with vanity, in Rhindoder's attempt to seek perfection, she sought the Abyss, which led to the destruction of an entire nation. Now in Sumeru, with Azar's blasphemous attempt to create a god, he cast aside the people of the city and used them for his own gains. He is only lucky that he never sought forbidden knowledge to enhance his goal as Conria once did. As when they similarly tried to create a being that could rival the divine, it is said that the now destroyed realm once sought forbidden knowledge and attempted to create perpetual motion machines that could match or even surpass primordial life forms. This mysterious, tireless mechanical monstrosity seems to be proof that they didn't reach heights that mortals should never have attained. Humans are seemingly unfit to rule themselves in the absence of a god as demonstrated in Sumeru, Conria, and Mondstadt. For those going well, all three of those nations were doing fine for a while. I say yeah! Yeah they were and that's great! Until they weren't. Because you see it only takes one. One bad ruler. Rome wasn't built in a day but it was it was destroyed in one, and without divine intervention, these bad rulers would inevitably have dug their nation deep into the ground as Conria did. When Mondstadt's Aristotle class was getting out of hand, Venti stepped up. When the sages were getting out of hand in Sumeru, the Traveler stepped up. But when King Ermin was going rogue in Conria, Celestia had to step up and put a stop to that foolishness. So once again, this is the reason Celestia has to play hardball and use exemplary punishment, because when humans get out of hand trying to surpass them, it's the humans themselves that suffer, and Celestia's job is to protect humanity, even if it's from humanity. You have a lovely world, hard fought by the people in Celestia, and all you do is seek more humanity. Stop, or they'll make you stop.